sequence is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 1, 0. All engine running. 4, 3, 2. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward, just. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn for you. We're pretty busy for Armstrong is on the moon, yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon. On this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Oh, that looks beautiful, man. We went once, we went a handful of times, and then we stopped. In 1969, the moon was a promise fulfilled. By December 1972, with Apollo 17, it was history. For more than 50 years, no human has returned. In that same span, we've sent probes beyond our solar system, built telescopes that can see back to the universe's first few hundred million years, and even mapped the human genome. Yet the moon, our closest neighbor, remains untouched by human feet. Why? The usual answers are well known. Politics, budgets, shifting priorities. And on paper, those are true. But something about them feels incomplete. Because history tells us that once humans breach a frontier, we rarely retreat. We circumnavigate the globe. We master the skies. We push until the impossible becomes routine. And yet, here is a frontier we've barely touched. Part of why it feels so strange is that our minds expect progress to move in a straight line. Psychologically, it's our reflex to extrapolate, to believe that if one step is possible, the next step will naturally follow. But we rarely see reality as it is. Instead, we see it through abstractions, filters, and stories that simulate continuity. The truth is, reality refuses to hold still, and space, more than any other domain, makes that refusal visible. It interrupts the arc we think we're on. It reminds us that we are Earth-dwelling beings, designed for its weight, its air, its rhythm. We are fit for its constraints and the farther we step away from them, the more fragile we become. We've always romanticized space. From the classroom to the cinema to stories told under a starlit sky, it's been painted as a realm of wonder, heroism, and limitless possibility. Space is where our bravest go to write humanity's next chapter. But the truth is far less romantic. Even the most brilliant, disciplined, and prepared minds can be undone, not by accidents, but by the quiet, constant forces of a vast, indifferent space. The danger isn't a fiery explosion, it's a slow, invisible unmaking. Gravity has always been there, silently shaping our skeleton, our muscles, even the wiring of our brains, it tells our blood where to flow, teaches our inner ear what up and down mean, and gives weight to every step we've ever taken. Remove it, and the blueprint begins to blur. On Earth, you don't have to think about balance when you stand, or circulation when you walk. Gravity is the background force that keeps every system in order. But in orbit, that constant teacher disappears. Astronauts float effortlessly, but the body is adrift in more ways than one. The inner ear loses its compass. The cardiovascular system no longer knows where to send fluids. The nervous system begins to rewire itself to a world with no down. It feels like freedom, drifting, floating, weightless. 
But hidden inside that freedom is the first fracture. A body built for Earth simply doesn't know what to do without gravity's steady hand. Without the steady press of our own bodies against the ground, bones begin to dissolve. In weight-bearing regions like the hips, spine and legs, astronauts can lose 1-2% to of bone density every month. That's the equivalent of compressing years of age-related osteoporosis into just a few weeks. NASA fights this decline with daily training, treadmills strapped with harnesses, resistance machines built for zero gravity, but exercise can only slow the erosion, not stop it. Even after returning home, full recovery is rare. X-rays show that the architecture of bone, the microscopic lattice that gives it strength, doesn't always rebuild. On the Moon, where gravity is only one-sixth of Earth's, the process doesn't reverse, it merely slows. Which means every extra week spent there is another layer of fragility added to the skeleton. The longer we stay, the more brittle the body becomes, until the very frame meant to carry us forward is quietly collapsing under its own absence of weight. The muscles we don't even think about, the calves that push us forward, the thighs that bear our weight, the spinal core that keeps us upright, all begin to wither in space. In microgravity, they no longer need to resist our body's weight, so the body conserves energy by letting them shrink. Within weeks, fibers that once fired automatically with every step begin to waste away. It isn't just raw strength that fades. Coordination slips too. The nervous system rewires itself to a world where standing is unnecessary, where balance is irrelevant. Returning astronauts often stagger like children learning to walk again, their brains struggling to remember what gravity feels like. Some need weeks of rehabilitation just to restore the ordinary act of moving across a room. Now imagine explorers meant to set up a base on lunar soil, struggling to steady themselves, their strength tuned for weightlessness, when the mission demands endurance, agility, and confidence on alien ground. It isn't the moon's landscape that betrays them, it's their own legs. On Earth, gravity acts as a constant pump, pulling blood downward toward the legs. Every time you stand up, your heart and blood vessels push back against that pull to keep your brain supplied. In space, that contest disappears. With no downward pull, fluids drift upward, flooding the chest, the neck, and the head. Faces puff, sinuses clog. The pressure inside the skull increases, pressing against delicate tissues around the eyes. At the same time, the heart itself begins to weaken. No longer straining against gravity's hydrostatic load, the cardiac muscle slowly atrophies, beating efficiently but with less power. Plasma volume drops, blood pressure regulation changes, and the body forgets how to stand. Back on Earth, this shows up as orthostatic intolerance, dizziness, blurred vision, or even fainting after only a few minutes upright. Astronauts have collapsed on landing day, their bodies unable to cope with gravity's return. On the moon, there is no ambulance waiting, only a fragile habitat, dependent on a crew whose circulation cannot fail. The brain itself begins to shift. In microgravity, it floats slightly higher inside the skull. At first, the movement is subtle, but over months, it alters the way the brain is shaped, stretching the fluid-filled ventricles and redistributing pressure. MRI scans of astronauts after long-duration missions reveal enlarged ventricles and shifts in brain tissue that weren't there before. 
These aren't just anatomical curiosities. They affect function, the lines of communication between brain regions, the white matter highways that coordinate balance, motor control and memory, begin to rewire. Astronauts often report changes in spatial awareness, a dulled sense of balance and shifts in mood. Some of these effects fade after return, others linger, suggesting that the nervous system doesn't fully reset to its Earth baseline. On missions that demand precision piloting, rapid judgment and unshakable focus, even small drifts become liabilities. A fraction of a second in delayed reaction or a lapse in spatial judgment is the difference between flawless docking and catastrophic error. No training program can fully erase it. Some astronauts return with blurred or distorted vision, not from fatigue or eye strain, but because the eye itself has physically changed shape. In microgravity, fluids shift toward the head and increase intracranial pressure. That pressure pushes on the back of the eye, flattening the globe and pressing against the optic nerve. NASA now recognizes this as spaceflight-associated neuroocular syndrome, or SANS. The condition can cause swelling of the optic disc, folds in the retina, and subtle shifts in the way light is focused. For some astronauts, the result is a hyperopic or far-sighted shift in vision that makes close work difficult. On short missions, symptoms may be mild. On longer missions, six months or more, the likelihood rises dramatically. Some of these structural changes fade with time back on Earth, but others persist for months and in rare cases, years. Permanent vision loss hasn't been documented, but in space exploration, the margin for error is already razor thin. If a mission depends on sharp eyesight, for docking, navigation, or landing, SANS could turn one blurred image into mission failure. Beyond Earth's magnetic shield, astronauts face a storm of invisible particles Cosmic rays and solar radiation slip through skin and tissue, colliding with DNA. Each hit can break a strand, scramble a sequence, or trigger mutations that ripple through the body. Some of this damage is repaired by the body's natural defenses, but not all of it. NASA's twin study, which tracked astronaut Scott Kelly during his year in space compared with his twin brother Mark on Earth, revealed just how deep the impact can be. Hundreds of genes related to immunity, stress response, and even the pace of aging switched on or off in orbit. Most of those changes reversed after he returned, but not all. Telomeres, the protective caps at the ends of chromosomes, lengthened in flight, then shortened rapidly on return, hinting at stress far below the cellular level. For a trip lasting weeks, the risks are manageable. But for months or years, the dice keep rolling. Radiation doesn't just scar tissue. It rewrites the biological script itself, one strand of DNA at a time. Space is not just empty. It is silence without end. There is no wind, no natural horizon, no rising or setting sun to mark the day. Aboard a spacecraft, the body loses its ancient cues, circadian rhythms begin to fray, and sleep becomes fragile. Astronauts often average barely six hours a night, even with medication, and the constant hum of machinery never really lets the mind rest. Isolation compounds the strain. Weeks or months in a confined capsule can turn even the most disciplined crew inward. Small frustrations grow. Communication with Earth carries a delay that stretches distance into disconnection. For some astronauts, the view of Earth sparks awe, what they call the overview effect, a euphoric sense of unity. But for others, it brings a sharper loneliness.
as if home has never felt farther away. Some astronauts return with a deeper appreciation of life. Others never feel quite at home again. On long missions, the risk isn't only breaking bones or losing muscle. It's breaking the will to continue. And on the moon, morale is not decoration. It is survival. This is the trap. Every adaptation to space takes you further from the human baseline you started with. The body is astonishingly flexible, but its flexibility comes at a cost. In weightlessness, bones thin, muscles shrink, the heart weakens, the brain shifts, and the eyes reshape. Each system adjusts to survive in orbit, but those adjustments make you less suited to live anywhere else. Back on Earth, astronauts spend months in rehabilitation. Their skeletons never quite regain the density they lost. Their cardiovascular systems struggle with standing upright. Some neurological and ocular changes linger long after landing. In other words, the farther you go from Earth, the less like an Earth-adapted human you become. Now project that forward. A mission to the Moon or Mars would not just test explorers at the edge of endurance, it would slowly erase the very capacities they rely on. Gravity is not just a background force, it is the script our bodies were written on. Remove it, and the writing itself begins to fade. Space doesn't explode you, it erases you, not in one violent instant, but one system at a time. Bones thinning, muscles withering, vision blurring, the mind bending under silence. And maybe that's the unspoken reason we haven't gone back. Because this time, humanity doesn't get to plant a flag and walk away. This time, the frontier pushes back. For centuries, our progress has followed a story arc we wrote for ourselves. Oceans crossed, mountains scaled, skies mastered. We expect the line to keep moving forward. That imagery is powerful. It carried us to the moon in the first place. But imagery isn't reality. Reality bends differently. It breaks the straight line. Politics may explain the pause on paper. Budgets may explain the delay. But underneath it all was the real reason. The human body falls apart in space. That truth pulled the politics and the budgets with it. And that's the deeper trap, mistaking imagery for structure. Assuming progress is inevitable just because we can picture it.